Welcome to Intergenerational Politics with Jill Weinbanks and Victor Shi, where we host weekly political discussions that are engaging and relevant to all generations. As always, we want to thank you for listening to Intergenerational Politics. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts to support future episodes. And we also have a website, intergenerationalpolitics.com. This is Victor Shi. I will be an incoming freshman next year at UCLA and also co-host this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Weinbanks, proud to be the co-host with Victor. I'm also the author of The Watergate Girl, a memoir of my time as the only woman on the trial team for the Watergate scandals. And I'm also an MSNBC legal analyst and have a long career behind that, bringing two points of view uh, to this podcast. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us Harvard Law School professor Jack Goldsmith, co-founder of Lawfare and President George W. Bush's Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel from 2003 to 2004 and Special Counsel to the Department of Defense from 2002 to 2003. Professor Goldsmith is the co-author of what Jill and I consider an extremely important and timely book after Trump, Reconstructing the Presidency, which is available anywhere you get your book. So we highly encourage you to get that. Um, This book explores the issues raised by Trump's presidency and how to fix those uh, going forward. Uh, His co-author is Bob Bauer, President Barack Obama's uh, White House counsel, which makes for a really interesting dynamic uh, between the two. Um, like Professor Goldsmith, Bob Bauer is a law professor at New York University. We look forward to discussing their book with Professor Goldsmith today, focusing on issues and specific reforms to the presidency that they see needed. Thank you so much for being here today, Professor Goldsmith. Or can I call you Jack? Please call me Jack. Okay. We want to start with some questions from Victor about the historical context of the issues that you raise in your book, because I I wanna make sure that his generation understands what is not normal about this administration and the severity of the damage that Trump's presidency has done to our government, its institutions, its norms, and to understand the work that's ahead to uh, make it better So like so many of my peers, I've studied history and read Jill's book. Um, So I have a basic understanding of kind of the the corruption surrounding the Nixon years. And I've avidly followed some of the Trump scandals, but I think it would be useful to help my generation to hear your view of how Trump and his administration compared to Nixon and to that of the president you served, President George W. Bush. Sure. Thank you for having me on. Um, So... The Nixon presidency was, uh, I would say, probably it it was certainly one of, if not the most corrupt presidencies in American history to that point. And um, at the end of the Nixon president, for a whole bunch of reasons, I mean, everybody knows about Watergate. Jill knows certainly about Watergate. Watergate was kind of the tip of the iceberg. Nixon um, basically used the Justice Department as, and also lots of other agencies of the government. As basically his arm to achieve his political ends, to attack his political opponents, he was using the intelligence agencies or trying to. And uh, so there was the attorney, two attorney generals went to jail under Nixon. Uh, There was there was serious, serious corruption. Lots of dozens of lawyers. I think how many, Joe, you probably know the answer, how how many people went to jail, including the White House counsel. Uh, Anyway. It was a it was a criminal organization. It really was, and that's not an exaggeration. At the highest levels of law enforcement, mm-hmm. at the end of the Nixon administration, that we had historic reforms of the executive branch, and they were designed to not just address the abuses that Nixon had committed, but a whole range of abuses in the presidency going back decades: war power stuff, uh, conflict of interest rules, presidential disclosure, transparency. And there were famous reforms in the 1970s of the presidency. And in my judgment, those were pretty serious, I'm sorry, pretty successful reforms. And we talk about this in the book. Mm-hmm. They did a pretty good job of closing the loopholes in accountability and in, um, and in conflicts of interest. And that regime worked pretty well for 50 years. It was partly a regime that was law, law focused, which means Congress passes the laws and and these are, they're legally binding restrictions on presidential action. And some of it was norm-based. You hear a lot about norms these days. 
Norms are non-legal rules. They're not legally binding, but they can be very consequential and they can shape behavior in the executive branch. These reforms, for the most part, most of them worked really well for 50 years. Uh, I'll just say something briefly about Bush since you asked about it, and then I'll talk about Trump. So the George W. Bush administration was controversial for a whole bunch of reasons. And in some respects, it did some very legally controversial things. But Trump's abuse is, as frankly, all presidents do. Barack Obama did some different kind of legally controversial things. And we live in an era in which presidents tend to be more and more aggressive, and that's a long-term generic trend. But Obama and Bush were within, you know, whatever their foibles on legality in some context were, they were in a pretty broad range of what I would call reasonable, norm-compliant, institution-respecting presidencies. Trump, uh, and I'll be quiet after this because I've gone on a bit, Trump has defied all of that. He has... Not only has he shattered the norms that uh, had worked for 50 years in constraining the presidency post Watergate, he just blew through those. For example, conflict of interest rules that were governed by norms instead of law, tax disclosure rules, DOJ independence rules, he just blew through those. And basically he was just, a, he was a classic populist demagogue. He was institution attacking and base and, and you know he had the authoritarian rhetoric he was norm defying so he really was a different kind of creature from all these prior presidencies including nixon and a lot of the constraints from the 70s that had worked pretty well for 50 years just didn't work with him yeah so so you know you make the distinction between norm breaking and uh law breaking but would, would you consider norm breaking um more or less dangerous than breaking laws because i think with Trump and Barr, we, we've seen a lot of norm breaking, but, but does that pose a greater, I guess, danger um, than law breaking, in your opinion? I, I mean, I don't think, I don't, with respect, I don't think that's the way to divide it. I mean, both of them can be bad. The reason that we have norms instead of laws a lot of the times is that it's sometimes hard to regulate things by law. And I'll give you an example. The president has constitutional power over prosecutions and over supervision of the executive branch. And so when it comes to things like special counsels and internal restrictions on the executive branch, Congress has some room for maneuver, but not as much as necessary. And in that context, we often have to rely on norms. Mm -hmm. And some of those norm violations can be terrible. I mean, Trump's has basically destroyed the credibility of the Justice Department, independent of what the Justice Department did, simply because through his violation of norms and urging them to do things to hurt his political enemies and to help his friends. And so those are really bad. And... But, so I wouldn't say that one is worse than the other. It's just two different types of re uh, ways that we regulate. Mm -hmm. Some legal violations are really bad. Some norm violations are really bad. I would say they're, they're, they're both dangerous and they both need to uh, be attended to. Sure, yeah. Um, so one thing that I find really interesting about your and uh, Bob's book is that you guys believe in the idea of an energetic presidency, which is also what um, Hamilton coined in his Federalist 70 papers. Um, and this is kind of what we saw with Attorney General Bill Barr, which he called the unitary executive theory. But correct me if I'm wrong here, unlike Bill Barr, you and Bob believe that there should be limits on executive power in order to safeguard the presidency from future abuses of power. Would that be correct? Yeah. So basically, let me just start off with answering the question about a strong presidency. Mm -hmm. So we're about to see everybody flip on a strong presidency. We're about to see the Democrats love a strong, aggressive presidency, and we're about to see the Republicans return to saying, oh my gosh, the executive is out of control. And the truth is that, and this is a point that we basically pick up on from Arthur Schlesinger Jr. 50 years ago in his mm -hmm. famous 50, uh, 45 years ago, in his famous book, The Imperial Presidency. Schlesinger said, we need a strong presidency to make separation of powers work. And that's especially true, unfortunately, in today's very complex and dangerous world and in an era in which Congress has fallen down on the job. So we're not in favor in this book of kind of fundamentally chopping down the presidency and making it a weak institution. That is not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is because we believe in a strong that a strong presidency is necessary to make the country work and to make separation of powers work, frankly. What we're trying to do is to ensure that the presidency is not enmeshed in dramatic conflicts of interest, that he's not mixing the private interest with the public interest, 
that there's adequate transparency, that there are safeguards to, sure, to ensure that he doesn't violate the law. Those are the kind of reforms that we focus on. There's a whole other set of reforms, and we talk about these in part three of the book, and we could have had, part three of the book is basically about classic separation of powers conflicts like war powers and vacancies reform and emergency powers. Those are conflicts that go back a long ways between the president and the Congress. And we have reforms on those. We could have spent thousands of pages talking about those types of things because that's because there, there are a lot of issues there. But the main things we focus on are, as I said, areas where the president is basically engaged in various forms of potential corruption. That's a lot of what our reforms are focused on. Yeah. And there's so many reforms in the book. We definitely want to get into them later. Each each one of the reforms that you propose in your book, you offer more than 50 out over the span of um, 14 chapters. But I think we can make each one into its own podcast episode. But we want to get into them later on. But just to circle back a little bit on uh -huh. some of the reforms that you talked about post-Watergate. Um, you know, Jill knows well about this. She explained some of them to me yesterday as we were preparing for this episode. But some of them included things like setting limits on contributions by individuals, political parties, and PACs, um, establishing an independent agency, um, the FEC as we now know it, and strengthening ethics compliances uh, by the 1978 Ethics in Government Act. So in your opinion, you know, one question I often wonder is like, what conditions led to Trump? Would you say that some of these reforms have loopholes that maybe allowed Trump to uh, have the kind of unfettered power that he has now? Or um, kind of what allowed some of the conduct that we see now with Trump? In, there was federal election reform. There's a federal election commission. This grew out of the 70s. And frankly, and this is what we have a whole chapter on this, one area where that just, there just wasn't, there were gaps and loopholes is reg with regard to foreign influence, both with regard to foreign contributions to campaigns and with the possibility, this is the Trump Tower meeting is the best example, the possibility of a campaign working with a foreign government and kind of colluding to affect an election. And we think it's pretty, there, there have been charges of political, of foreign political interference in elections for two elections now. And the FEC just wasn't adequately focused on that problem. And we document why and explain the history. And that's a, a series of loopholes that needs to be closed. The Ethics in Government Act, um, I'll just say a couple of things about that. That was a major reform of the 70s also. There were about 12 of them. And, that, and we just, this is the second one, the, the um, Ethics in Government Act. It did a lot of different things. One of the things it did was to set up an independent council. Remember Ken Starr during the Clinton administration? Um, the independent council under that statute was not a successful regime, and it went too far in giving independence to the independent council. And by 1999, there was bipartisan consensus that that was a bad way to go. And so we got the regulations that ended up being used by Mueller. We think that system needs updating as well. We have a lot of very technical, complicated things to say about that. One other thing about the Ethics and Government Act the Ethics and Government Act was in part designed to prevent conflicts of interest and corruption in the executive branch, mm -hmm. but most of those reforms did not apply to the president. So the conflict of interest rules regarding mixing business with a public, private business with public uh, service, they technically do not apply to the president. And that's been governed by norms and not law. That's a loophole that needs to be closed and we mm -hmm. talk about ways to close it. So the two laws you mentioned are two laws that did a pretty good job, but Trump exploited some and made clear some loopholes in them that we think need to be closed. For sure. Yeah, many, many loopholes indeed. Um, can you talk about also the role of Citizens United for my generation and kind of what role that played in what we're seeing now in terms of some of the troubling campaign finance and ethics issues? We don't really get into that very much. We don't get into the Citizens United issue. We focus mostly on um, because that, those are First Amendment protections for certain types of campaign donations. We don't focus on that in this book. Bob's an expert on that. I'm not an expert on that. What we focus on is foreign electoral um, campaign contributions. And the First Amendment analysis in Citizens United and First Amendment analyses like that just don't apply in that context. The, supreme, the foreign governments and foreign persons do not have the same... First Amendment rights to be involved in campaign contributions. So that's really kind of a collateral issue for us in this book. So I, I'd love to follow up then with Bob on uh, Citizens United, but I, I'd love to follow up on both the uh, special prosecutor uh, comments that you made, uh, because I certainly agree that the independent counsel law that governed Starr was way out of line 
but I see many, many problems with what we have now, and there is not enough independence now. Um, but okay, we've talked about some historical contents. I, I'd like to move forward to a question that I frequently get asked about why I wrote my book now. In the case of your book, uh, the answer seems obvious to me, which is that you wrote the book because first you saw great deviations from rules and norms that were harming our institutions of government, and you had ideas for solutions, so you wrote the book. Would that be uh, a good statement of why you wrote the book? That, that, that's fairly accurate. I'll give you a, just a bit of the background. So Bob and I we're friends, we became friends, but we have kind of different perspectives. We worked in different administrations. We're, we have different political views. We were gonna write a book just about the White House Counsel's Office and we met to talk about that book. And over the course of the day and talking about that book, we, we made the point that you just made that there are all these problems Trump has presented, but everybody knows that. It's been on the front page of the newspaper for four years. Yeah. And there have been dozens and dozens of books talking about how horrible Trump is and how he's broken norms and all that. And what we decided about a year ago, it was about a year and a half ago, I guess, maybe it was just a year ago, that we would try to write a book that would be constructive. They'd say, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And so we wrote, so that's, that was the impetus for the book. We didn't know what we were going to agree on. We didn't know what we were going to cover when we started. And so the idea of this book was there because Trump has done the things he's done, there's just no doubt that there's going to be a reform debate starting next January uh, across a whole array of issues. And we can talk if you want about priorities and what's realistic and what isn't, but there's going to be a huge debate about reforming the presidency. And we wanted this book to kind of be the handbook to how to think about it. Now, you don't have to agree with our reforms, but for each one, we give all the relevant background, the relevant laws, we try to make it accessible. There's a lot of technical legal stuff, but the historical materials and the Trump-related materials we think are accessible. So our goal was to try to be constructive and not just critical, to try to do so in a bipartisan spirit, and to try to be you know, useful to people in this debate, even if they don't agree with our particular solutions. Well, I agree that you have definitely made these reforms accessible. I don't think you have to be a lawyer to understand both the problems that you present and the solutions to those problems. So congratulations on that. I think one one interesting idea of the book is that you and um, you know Bob Bauer, you guys write the book together and you're, like Jill said, you are a Bush Republican. He's an uh, Obama Democrat. Um, was there any intention that by, you know, by having two people who may disagree on policy, but agree on the need to reform the power of the presidency, that maybe um, by writing the book together, you might be able to unite our country and have readers of any political ideology understand how far the Constitution and norms um, of Trump's conduct is, and to allow Democrats and Republicans both to take a hard look at the problems of the last four years and the solutions that could uh, fix that. I, I wouldn't quite put it that way because um, I mean I don't have any illusions about what leads to reform, and the fact that Bob and I have different political views, the answer is yes and no. We we didn't we we it is true that we've been talking to both Republicans and Democrats in the Congress about these reforms. It is true that there's a kind of, uh, believe it or not, it, it, it's not heavily populated, but there's kind of a centrist or a group of people from both Republican and Democratic parties who think some of these reforms are vitally necessary. We thought it was very important to get away from the kind of gotchas of which reforms help which, which presidents try to abstract away from the politics of particular presidencies. All of those things we hoped would be facilitated, and we hope that if we could agree on things, since we have kind of different perspectives, mm -hmm. that that would be, that we, if we could reach a consensus, maybe others could as well. So that was the extent of our ambition. But I don't have any illusions that the fact that Bauer and I did this are going to uh, convince people who are otherwise not convincible. I do think one, I'll just say one more thing about this and be quiet. Um, a lot of these reforms, I think, you know, there's a question about priorities and, and how much time there is on various agendas. But a lot of these reforms, which look like anti-Trump reforms during the Trump's presidency and therefore wouldn't get much Republican support, have been things that Republicans traditionally support, like conflict of interest rules in the presidency and tax disclosure rules. That norm was well accepted for 50 years. So we hope on some of those things that when Trump is gone and he's not seen as the political target of these things, that maybe people, you know, that the, the earlier consensus can reemerge and maybe we can make some progress on these issues. Uh, following up on that, 
one of the concerns that Victor and I both have is that facts and truth and reality have somewhat evaporated into two different bubbles where there is the Fox News viewer who believes one set of information and the MSNBC crowd who believes something completely different. Is there anything either in writing your book that you've given thought to about how you can get Trump voters to understand what happened in his administration, why reform is necessary, why this is not politically targeting him, but just is helping to strengthen democracy? So I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, the answer to that question is I don't know. We don't have any great solutions for dealing with what you describe as our bubbled political culture, and I definitely agree with you. And um, it, affects, it affects all of these reforms, because as we talked about in the first chapter, at the end of the day, at some point, these, that, you know, governance can only work if there's at least a thin consensus on basic democratic principles. And you know, we haven't reached rock bottom on that yet, but we are deeply polarized, as you say, on what the facts are. And so I don't, we don't have a solution to that problem. I do think, well, I should say I hope, I hope that when Trump is gone from the scene, or at least when he's left the presidency, we've already started to see this in some Republicans peeling away from him as we get closer to the Biden presidency. We've seen that more and more. One hopes, but who knows? This is one of the big questions, that as Biden becomes president, as Trump is no longer seen as the literal target of these reforms, as the recipient of some of these presidential restrictions shifts from being Trump to Biden, even though, of course, Biden doesn't need conflict of interest rules to comply with the conflict of interest rules or in laws, or Biden doesn't need the tax disclosure law to be made into law for him to comply. But the hope is, is that there's enough Republicans that will return to their traditional Republican position since there's a Democrat president that you can see some bipartisan consensus emerging. Whether that's possible or not, though, is for the reasons you say and for other reasons, I just don't know. It's interesting because, of course, one of the advantages we had during Watergate was that there was only one set of facts presented to the American people, no matter what network you watched. And basically, there were only three. NBC, ABC, CBS, everybody had the same facts. And even during the Irvin Senate hearings, the Democrats and the Republicans agreed on the facts, which made bipartisanship work and made reforms possible. But you, you also sort of previewed something that I wanted to do with you, which is um, sort of a lightning round of quick answers, because um, hopefully you'll come back and talk more in depth about some of these things. But sure. there are some areas that I think need fixing, most of which are addressed in your book, but not 100%. So I wanted to just go through some of these issues that I think citizens want fixed now and have you tell me whether you think they are fixable and um, whether you know there's a, a quick answer you might have as to what could be done. Okay. So one okay. of them is the emoluments clause, something that nobody ever heard of before because it had never actually arisen to a point where a president violated it. Uh, now we have clear examples. What can be done about that? I know a lot of people are asking me that. Yeah, so I'm not gonna get into the weeds too much. We have two chapters on this in the book. And the emoluments clause, the emoluments clauses are about pr the president benefiting, mainly the, pro the concern is the president benefiting from foreign contributions that, that benefit the president personally. The emoluments clauses themselves in the Constitution, the litigation under the emoluments clause against Trump. Trump has, there's been no president who has gone to nearly the same degree as Trump as mixing business with public office and with benefiting in his business from foreign governments in a whole bunch of ways uh, that even if it doesn't affect policy, it has the appearance of affecting policy, and it almost certainly does affect policy. And these are terrible things. So we have specific reforms on those about how to uh, you know, make it insist on pain of criminal penalty that the president has to separate himself from his business, get rid of blind trust, which we don't think work, have a whole bunch of very rigorous transparency reforms. And Congress can enforce the emoluments clause, even if the emoluments clause itself is not... Uh, enforceable directly. And we think that basically the president and the businesses he owns has to report all 
on pain of criminal penalty, all uh, receipt of income or monies from foreign sources, foreign government sources. So we do have a very specific way of implementing the emoluments clause. We think it can be done constitutionally. The emoluments clause by itself is hard to enforce, but Congress can, through its power, make it something real. And that would sort of apply, I think, to conflicts of interest, the release of tax returns. What about yep. nepotism? Um, it's not unheard of to hire your relatives. It goes back to well, maybe even further, but uh, in my lifetime, uh, Jack Kennedy hiring his brother as the attorney general. But we've seen a new level of nepotism here with uh, the president's daughter, his son-in-law. Um, they've now named part of the embassy in Jerusalem after his son-in-law. I think this is a new level of nepotism. Is there something that should be done about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's, there's some things that can be done. Basically, the short answer is that all of our conflict of interest rules, all of our tax disclosure rules, all of the rules that look at the possibility of and try to weed out corruption where you mix in private and public business, we think should be extended to anyone in the family who has any role in the presidency at all. So that would, Kushner would be subject to all of these rules. Beyond that though, it's very hard. The president has, the president can hire whomever he wants. Now in the Kennedy case, that was a serious case of nepotism, but there the president, you know, at least the Senate had to confirm Robert Kennedy to be right. attorney general. There was a check, there was a serious hearing. There was a big public debate about whether there was a good or bad idea. The bigger concern is when the president brings his, his daughter and son-in-law into the White House where you don't need Senate confirmation and put them in part charge of policy jobs. It's actually very hard for Congress to stop the president from putting them in charge of these policy jobs. The president is allowed to select whom he wants to carry forth his policies. Presidents have used relatives in all sorts of circumstances. So we don't think you can regulate that directly. What you can do is to ensure that they're subject to all of the same transparency and accountability rules as everybody else. And that's not necessarily the case now. Okay. Um, I wanna talk about lying to the public. During Watergate, <laughs> when we did our roadmap and gave all the evidence we had to the House Judiciary Committee for impeachment purposes, we identified public lies that Nixon had told. Uh, we put down this is what he said on such and such a date. Here's what the facts are. We thought those were impeachable offenses. They are clearly not covered by perjury laws or false statement statutes. But could it be? Is it, and should it be? I think it's very, very hard, probably impossible to regulate presidential public lying just by itself. And let, you know, if it's tied to obstruction of justice or bribery or something, maybe. But regulating public lying itself as a crime and even as a grounds for impeachment by itself, I think that's very hard. To some extent, and I don't mean to be too cynical, but every president lies. There are big lies and small lies. Trump told lots of big lies every day of his presidency. He was a very extreme case. But presidents sometimes shade the truth. Sometimes they emphasize certain things that could be viewed as, as false. As false. You can't regulate that because it's part of politics, and I think it would be I think it would be unconstitutional to do so, and very hard to do it in an operative way. Um, now, you can regulate lies related to certain really corrupt activities with regard to obstruction of justice or bribery, uh, things like that, and we do have proposals for those kind of things. But I I mean maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you have a proposal, but I don't see how you could do. Uh, and and the roadmap, by the way, tied all those lies into criminal prohibitions. Yes, um, but, but I do think there are, and maybe it's only because of the extremity of the lies that Donald Trump has told, you know, we've often called them misinformation. And you now have on Twitter, you have certain warnings, which I consider to be completely uh, inadequate to the task at hand, where more than 70 million people believe what he's saying. And we're threatening democracy and the credibility of our elections by his false statement that there's fraud involved, for example. Now, those were all public statements. They aren't under oath. They aren't to a government agency, so they don't fall within you know, the statutory punishable crimes. But the damage they do is so severe that I think we need to look at some way of controlling it. But maybe we'll have yeah, that I, for another uh, day I'll just where say, we can spend... Uh, I, 
yeah, I won't get into it except to say that I'm skeptical that it's doable and constitutionally. And I'm not sure it's a good idea. Look, the problem of misinformation is a huge problem. But if you have the government getting involved and telling you what's true and what isn't true, I think that's going to make the problem worse. Right. I just think, you know, I just, so it's a seriously difficult problem to deal with. And I agree it's a, it's a problem. And let, let's talk about um, maybe something like the IGs which have become a real problem. And um, there was testimony, I think yesterday, by some IGs, at least this week, um, talking about the fact they need more protection because we've had IGs doing their job, getting fired for making disclosures of what is clearly um, information the public needs to have. Uh, is there something that should be done to reform the presidency and the control and firing of IGs. Yes, and we have some proposals in the book. Um, so inspectors general are again, a reform that really got going in the 1970s. These are quasi independent um, inspectors or you know auditors inside of major agencies. And they basically look for wrongdoing and corruption inside the agency and they have a special relationship to Congress. They were very controversial legally, constitutionally, back in the 70s when they started going. The Carter Justice Department said they were part of it was unconstitutional. But they've grown into, I'm just giving you this bit of background before I answer your question, they've grown into these really important institutions in, in kind of telling us the truth about what's going on in the executive branch. And they've been very successful. Michael Horowitz in the Justice Department, who's an outstanding inspector general, has issued one outstanding report after another, very bipart bipartisan, full of integrity, very useful. Other inspectors general have done great work in this administration. And as you say, Trump has fired ones he didn't like. So it's kind of a hard problem to fix directly. There are basically two solutions that are being discussed. One is to try to ramp up the criteria for a president to be able to fire an inspector general to make it for cause and, and, and make it, you know, have to, yeah, the president has to have a good reason to fire. Unfortunately, it's not clear if that's gonna be constitutional, especially given the Supreme Court. And, um, and it's also not clear it would be very effective because the president can always come up with pretextual reasons why those reasons are satisfied. So we don't think that's a terribly useful way to go. We think the better way to go, and this is what we propose in the book is to ensure that if a president fires an inspector general, which he's going to be able to do if he really wants to, that he can't put a crony in there. That he has to basically only have two options for replacing that inspector general. One, because that's what Trump tried to do in a lot of these cases, fire the, the good guy and put in a crony. And we would focus on not allowing them to put in a crony by ensuring that it has to be the person that comes in there to be acting inspector general has to be either someone who the Senate has confirmed in another inspector general slot or someone who's been in that inspector general office as kind of a career person, someone who's not a presidential crony. And we think those two reforms are constitutional and they would basically create disincentives for the president to fire an inspector general because you wouldn't be able to put a crony in to reach the ends you wanted. That's what we think about it. They're very important institutions. It's a very hard problem. I have a lot of other issues on my list here. Um, and I don't want to run out of time. So I'm going to list a couple of them at a time and see if you want to comment on any of them. One that I think is really important is what's happened to congressional oversight and their rights and their subpoena powers during this administration where stonewalling has reached new heights. Um, and I'm not just talking about stonewalling criminal investigations. I'm talking about congressional investigations of children in cages, for example, where the administration has refused to allow people to testify. So that's one maybe that you could comment on. Um, and then I'll list a couple of others. Sure. So I'm going to be brief. I mean, this, this is a deep topic. And I'm going to be brief. So I would say this. You're right that Trump has been an extreme on resisting congressional oversight. But it's the same pe I mean, I used to work in the office in the Justice Department, the Office of Legal Counsel that advises on these questions. And the truth is that all presidents are aggressive on in resisting uh, congressional subpoenas. Obama was, Holder was famously um, held in contempt for not applying with one of this, with a subpoena from Congress that was Obama's attorney general. So this is an area where the president, I mean, again, Trump was extreme, but presidents have always been aggressive on this. 
we have a proposal in the book uh, and the proposal is the problem and let me say something else there's a judicial review of these subpoenas the supreme court looked at one of these last summer and it basically in a bipartisan seven to two decision said that congress had gone too far in some of these subpoenas and it and and that the president's claims were too aggressive also and that the 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 right answer was somewhere in the middle so there's oversight in the judiciary we also propose that that process be sped up one problem is is that a president can run out the clock by delaying and delaying litigation takes a long time to see whether these subpoenas are valid and we basically propose a fast track process for having judges resolve these separation of powers disputes more quickly so that presidents can't win just by running out the clock. Okay, some of the other things that are mentioned in your book that are worth maybe a brief comment are uh, foreign interference, foreign state influence in our government, uh, press and how the presidency, this presidency has handled the press, um, nuclear power uh, codes, uh, courts. Can you talk about some of those? Sure. I'm going to give you just bullet point answers uh, because right. each one I could spend 10 minutes on. So let's see if I remember the foreign interference point. We, I talked about a little bit. The basic problem here is that there are gaps in federal election law that allow, and Mueller talked about this in his, in his report, he couldn't prosecute certain things he thought maybe should be crimes because the law wasn't clear enough. And other places there were just gaps and so we basically would close those loopholes we would prevent we would criminalize expressly things like the trump tower meeting in 2016 where there's an attempt to have something like a mutual aid agreement between a foreign government and a campaign about for the purpose of influencing the election we would require campaigns to report to the fbi any contacts from foreign states offering campaign support so there are a whole bunch of things that you can do to just stop that from happening and right now the laws are not adequate so that's one thing. Nuclear power, um, again, this is a really hard problem. This is a reform that's not going to happen anytime soon. This is one of the hardest ones in the book. Basically, Trump scared the hell out of a lot of us by threatening in a casual way and in a seemingly ad hoc way and trivial way on Twitter to use to press the button, his button's bigger, and the like. And it raises the question whether we should put in the hands of one person, the President of the United States, the complete and total discretion over whether to use these most destructive of weapons. And we think the answer to that question is no. And we have a proposal in the book to constrain presidents not from using nuclear weapons in ways that are consistent with the U.S. deterrence policy, if there's an incoming nuclear weapon, obviously, or if there's a serious threat but we would make it illegal and give the bureaucrats in the government the power to at least put up some some sand in the in the in the process if a president just uses wants to use nuclear weapons in a really trivial situation. Um, but those are two of the ones you asked about. What were the others? Do you want me to speak to the press? Them? The press. You, you have a so the press. This is a very hard. This is a very this is a very hard one. We have a couple of reforms, but I'll just talk about the main one. So Trump has been extremely unprecedentedly abusive towards the press probably worse than Nixon, although we do a comparison in the book, it's close. And Nixon, there's more evidence of Nixon kind of retaliating by using the government against the press than, than Trump did, but that's the main thing we worry about. There, there are a lot of things to worry about. You might, you want to not allow the president to have tendentious control over, you don't want him to, you want to have a regularized process for press access. But the main thing we're worried about is the president using the tools of government, the IRS, the Justice Department, or something like that to, re to retaliate against a member of the press. So we set up a mechanism to make sure that can't happen. And if it does happen, that there's an investigation. And we think that will go a long way towards ensuring that that most abusive, uh, of, that most abusive attitude towards the press can't happen. Okay, so thank you so much for the epic lightning round. Um, you know, we mentioned, you know, a lot of issues. Um, but like I said before, your book offers over 50 concrete solutions to issues ranging from attacks on the media to war powers. Um, they're all so timely, we could literally make each reform its own podcast episode. But just for today's purposes, um, I want to dive deep into one issue that's kind of on the top of everyone's minds right now, and also in the headlines, which is the pardon power. And so um, some of the headlines that uh, have been released uh, last week, you know, some 
one from the uh, NPR wrote that uh, Trump pardons Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, and Charles Kushner. The New York Times leading headline was uh, Trump pardons two Russia inquiry figures and Blackwater guards. And now I guess, you know, we've seen controversial pardons in the past. We've seen it with Clinton. But what's strikingly clear is that with many of Trump's pardons, it's not for the purpose of granting mercy or righting a wrong. Instead, it's to undo the Mueller investigation, help himself and his family and his supporters, reward those who have refused to cooperate with prosecutors and protected Trump from criminal culpability. Um, So for all of us, I think that leaves us with a question, which is what can be done to ensure that a president granting a pardon is doing it to achieve justice and mercy, which is the original intention of a pardon, rather than to serve his own self-interest? Okay, it's a hard question. I'm going to give you, I don't know how long you would give you. I'll try to keep it to a couple of minutes. First of all, the pardon power is one of the broadest executive presidential powers in the Constitution. Trump is not the first president to use the pardon power in the kind of context you were talking about. Bill Clinton famously on his last day in office pardoned all sorts of people, including his brother and someone involved in the Whitewater investigation that some people thought was covering up for him. And he circumvented the pardon attorney in the Justice Department, the Mark Rich thing. So Clinton did that. George H.W. Bush pardoned people in the Iran-Contra thing, which sounds a little bit like that were under investigation from the independent counsel. So Trump is not the first one to use the pardon power in this abusive way. But what those other presidents did exceptionally, Trump does as a matter of course. Almost all of his pardons have this kind of self-serving uh, impact. So that's the first point. The second point is, you know, Madison said that any power, uh, if it's a good power, if you're giving someone enough discretion to exercise the pr- power well, it's always going to be subject to abuse. And unfortunately, that's true, and it's true of the pardon power. And under so there are two types of solutions. One is, under the current constitutional understanding, what can you do? Basically, all you can't prevent him from pardoning people in self-serving ways. That that. that and Trump is by far the most crass and abusive on this. Mm. You can't stop that generally without amending the Constitution. What you can do, and what we propose, is that Congress enact statutes to make clear, and we think that without this clarity it won't work, to make clear that if a president, and there are many cases that I'm about to tell you that may be implicated by what Trump did, that if a president pardons to keep someone quiet in an investigation or to cover up you know, and protect himself in an investigation, i.e. for obstruction of justice purposes, that can be a crime, and we think that can clearly be done constitutionally. Mm. Or there are suggestions that some of Trump's pardons were in exchange for massive campaign contributions. It's possible that that could be a bribe, and we think the bribery statute should be clarified to make clear that it is a bribe and can be prosecuted as a bribe. So those extreme uh, abuses you can do something about, but, you know, just pardoning people that he feels like serve his political interests, if there's no bribery or obstruction of justice or something like that, the pardon power allows that. And we're going to have a big debate in this country. And the pardon power can be used for really great ends. The framers gave it to the president to serve mercy and to serve social uh, reconciliation. And, you know, many presidents have used it that way. Some people think the pardon power is broken and should be used more aggressively to relieve people of sentences. But so there's going to be a big trade off. The question is, can we if you want to have a constitutional debate and have a constitutional amendment, which is hard to do, you can start doing things. But then there's a trade off about the good aspects of the pardon power. The last thing I'll say briefly is there's a chance he's going to pardon himself. I think a pretty good chance, a self so-called self pardon. No president has ever done this. There's no precedent for it. There's one sentence in a Justice Department opinion that says it's not allowed, but it has no explanation. You know, this is a question that can only be answered ultimately by courts. If Trump pardons himself and the Biden administration tries to investigate or prosecute him, then we can have a legal case to figure out the answer the courts will tell us. We propose that Congress weigh in on that and make clear that it believes as an institution that the pardon, self-pardon is, uncon- is illegal. But uh, Congress doesn't have the final say on that. The courts do. Yeah, for sure. Um, one reform that I'm curious to hear a take on is uh, regarding the power of the office of the pardon attorney, which usually provides the most compelling people to pardon, uh, but Trump has basically bypassed um, them. Do you think there should be more explicit rules or statutory changes that the office of pardon attorney should pursue uh, under the Biden administration or in the future so that they are the sole entity responsible for suggesting possible pardons? So this is a this is a big and complicated issue. And, and 
again, we could spend an hour on this. So some people on the left, progressive criminal justice reform types, they think the pardon attorney process is broken. And they think that there's not enough mercy being doled out. The pardon attorney process in the Justice Department is slow. It focuses on old crimes. Um, and Barack Obama grew so frustrated with it that he basically put in process, a different process and, and had a different program for granting clemency for people with who committed low-level crimes, drug crimes, and the like. Mm -hmm. So there's a criticism of having the pardon attorney be have such control. Trump has totally, almost totally... Sorry, Trump has almost totally blown off the pardon attorney power. I just actually published something on this today, which is, mm -hmm. what's today, Tuesday, Wednesday? Tuesday, um, yeah. I, I just published something on this about an hour ago. Um, and he's almost completely cut out the pardon attorney, but he hasn't used it. Some, and some of his pardons, some people in the criminal justice world think, have been good. And they think that there's actually virtue in blowing up the pardon attorney because it's been such a conservative, and I don't mean that in a political way, force on presidential pardons. But of course, part, Trump has circumvented it mostly to serve his ends. So there are a whole bunch of reforms out there. I do think the pardon process needs to be reformed. Should it be some bipartisan commission? Should it be some institution? Should the courts be involved? Should we rethink the criteria for pardons? All of that should be rethought. So I would just say, in conclusion, two things. Trump, there's a case to be made that the current pardon attorney process isn't optimal, mm -hmm. but Trump has still abused it, even though he's still abused it in an unprecedented way. So that's a long answer. Sorry about that. No, all good, all good. And in connection with Above the Law, I want to talk about the Department of Justice, where I was very proud to be able to serve and used to feel very proud to go into court and say, on behalf of the people of America, I'm here today for. And that's something that I think current uh, prosecutors within the department, current lawyers in the department may not feel so much because of the politicization that has happened. Um, and even with Bill Barr resigning uh, in the last weeks of the administration, his abuses of power within his office um, are something we've talked a lot about on this podcast, but um, Let's look forward then and say, what are the qualifications and traits that Biden's attorney general should possess? Uh, is there anyone that you particularly uh, are looking to who you think would have the kind of balance to lead the department, restore its integrity? So it's a great question. Bob and I talked a lot. The, the, the ideal of an attorney general in modern times, we think, is the attorney general that came in after Watergate, Edward Levy. And he was Gerald Ford's attorney general, and he was someone of extraordinary integrity, bipartisan credibility, enormously honest, widely respected across the aisle. He was honest in dealing with Justice Department problems after Watergate, but he was also, you know, defended the department and executive prerogatives. He was just an extraordinary attorney general. Bob and I, I don't know if you agree with that, but- um, I do, I definitely do. Bob, Bob and I asked ourselves a lot, is there an Edward Levy out there today? Can we even have an Edward Levy given our politicized, um, you know, culture, political culture? And it's a very serious question about whether there's someone with an, with that kind of integrity, bipartisan credibility, et cetera. Um, I don't, I, I'm the last person that should be advising the Biden administration about who they should choose for <laughs> attorney general. But the one person who's been mentioned, who I think comes very close to meeting that is Merrick Garland. Uh, Garland is someone who basically is as close to a figure like Edward Levy as I know. And, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of really tough decisions the next attorney general has to make, including tough decisions that are going to be p politically painful for the president. I mean, you know, if, if, if the next attorney general decides not to be aggressive about prosecuting Trump, that's going to be, that's going to be politically very fraught. Anything he does on that score is very fraught. You want someone with seriously good judgment, lots of experience and the like, and, and with wide credibility. I think Garland meets that. There may be others, I don't know, but I think it's an extremely difficult job and that job is much harder to do now than it was even, even than it was 50 years ago. I have to point out that Edward Levy was from the University of Chicago where you were for a, a while um, and that Merrick Garland is from Illinois. In fact, yep. he's from the same high school that I went to. 
So um, that's very exciting to us Illinois people. Um, but l just a few more things on DOJ, because I think it's such yep. an important institution in our government. The relationship between DOJ and the White House um, fell into disrepair during Nixon. Um, and in retrospect, I mean, the White House Counsel's Office was in direct contact with my former boss, uh, Henry Peterson, head of the criminal division, um, and was getting information that was helping in the cover-up. And yep. is there any way to reform that relationship through statute? I think it's very, very hard to reform that through statute because of the Article 2. Um, you know, the, the core of the core of the core of the executive power that the president possesses is control over law enforcement and um and justice department business basically and i don't think i think it's going to be very hard for a whole bunch of constitutional reasons having to do with article two maybe the opinions clause and the like but especially the vesting clause and the take care clause of the constitution i think it's very hard for congress to pass that and by the way i don't think a biden administration i think this this administration this is just a prediction i don't have any insights here the Biden administration is, I think, going to be a pro-reform administration, including internal executive branch reforms. I don't think that they would accept a statutory solution there. I think they think it has to be. I'm just guessing, but I know the way executive branches have thought for the last 50 years. And I think the consensus is that has to be done through internal regulations and internal practices and not, um, not uh, by statute. And that's my view as well. So, you probably don't agree with that. No, well, uh, it needs a more thoughtful, longer term discussion than we have time for. But one thing that is bothering me that I worry a lot about is based on what Trump has done in the past when he revealed Israeli intelligence to the Russian uh, ambassador, I worry about him revealing intelligence that could hurt America once he's out of office. Is would that change your view of whether the president should be uh, prosecuted if we found that he did so, do that? So you mean if he did it after he left office? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, my view is that the president that there's a I don't want to say it's an absolute bar. My view is there's a very, very high bar of clear criminality that can be successfully prosecuted, but it's for presidential actions that are during office. If Trump commits a crime once he leaves office, go for it. I mean, I think that he should face the full brunt of the law. And by the way, I worry very much about, um, I worry very much about Trump doing that. Uh, I wrote a piece somewhere, I can't remember where, about, you know, how, whether he could be prosecuted for doing that. I think it's hard to prosecute him. You're absolutely right to be concerned that he's going to disclose secrets. He doesn't even have control over himself. He, he likes to sell things. He needs money. Um, I think it's easy or much easier to prosecute him if he does that after he leaves office than if he does it during office while he's in office. Okay. And I'm, I'm totally for, I'm, and I would not be remotely opposed to that. Thank you. That makes me feel much better. Um, one issue that you and Bob disagree on in your book is whether the next Department of Justice should go after Trump. And I think this is the main question when it comes to this kind of area, the Department of Justice, that um, a lot of people are going to kind of raise concerns about or raise questions on. And it's, you know, a lot of progressives are going to believe that, you know, Biden should go after Trump and hold him accountable. Some moderates, many Republicans will argue no. Um, but that's one issue that you and Bob disagree on. So what's your take and um, why is that? Yeah. So briefly... So Bob and I, when we set out to write this book, we had no idea what we were going to agree on or disagree on. And this is the one issue that we had relatively small but real disagreement on. Bob's view is that the next administration should investigate all serious allegations of crimes that, get, that Trump committed while in office. His basic argument is very powerful. The current rule is that a president is not, under the Justice Department, is that a president is not allowed to be prosecuted while in office. So if you have a rule of not prosecuting the president after office, then you basically have a rule of presidential immunity, and that's inconsistent with the rule of the law. That's a very powerful argument. I, I agree with that argument, but there's a but and another side, and I kind of take the other side in the book, and that is this. Under the current array, there are about five reasons why I think that would be an imprudent step for the Biden administration to take. One is that under the current set of laws, it's not clear you can actually prosecute Trump. 
the obstruction of justice statutes we propose lots of reforms to the obstruction of justice statute precisely so a president can be prosecuted in the absence of those reforms i think that his clear attempts at obstruction of justice there's no doubt that he did that just read volume two of the Mueller report it's not clear that they're crimes i don't think that, that you could prosecute him successfully in a way that would be upheld in the supreme court so you're already starting off in a way where i think it's very challenging to do then there's the problem of it would just be such a political circus to do so it's going to keep trump in the spotlight it's going to take a lot of energy and resources by the biden administration and the biden justice department it's going to make it hard no due to no fault of the biden justice department necessarily for the Justice Department to return to kind of apolitical law enforcement. I don't want to say apolitical, but more balanced law enforcement, because that whole thing will be seen through the lens, rightly or wrongly, of vendetta and the like. And then the last reason, and the last reason is, in addition to those reasons, and not thinking the prosecution can be successful, is I just think it would be a terrible precedent. We've, Trump is under investigation for pre-presidential crimes in New York, and I think those should continue. And I think, uh, there's no, but I think it's a terrible precedent to start having one administration rife, you know, search through the prior administration's acts for crimes. Because I guarantee you, if it happens here, it's going to be reciprocated. And we've already seen this a little bit in the Bar Durham investigation, which was looking back at the past administration through the lens of criminal law. And I worry very much about setting that precedent. So I'll just say, in summing up, there's no easy solution here. It's a question of which is which poison do you want, basically. So in the absence of uh, Bob to speak to the other point of view, let me just say, I agree with Bob. Uh, I have long believed that the president himself is indictable while a sitting president. I do not agree with the Office of Legal Counsel opinion. I certainly believe he is indictable, investigatable, triable after he's out of office. Uh, I thought that with Richard Nixon, as soon as he resigned, that he should be indicted and added to the crimes that his colleagues were being tried for. Um, and I do think that the arguments are mostly political against indicting uh, President Trump after he's out of office. And I certainly get those about having President Biden be able to move forward with his agenda and accomplish something and not be held back. But I think the precedent of leaving a uh, president above the law is too awful. Okay, so um, thank you so much for this conversation. It was such a great one. And like you know, we've said in the podcast, there are so many solutions of the in the book. We cover some of them, and we hope that we gave our listeners a solid understanding of what some of those reforms are. But are there any that we haven't mentioned that you think our audience should know about um, as we head into the next four years in the next administration? We, we've covered most of them. I'll just say one briefly that legal nerds know about that the public is perhaps less aware of and that's vacancies reform mm. this is the problem of when of the president putting in temporary figures atop the executive branch and circumventing the senate check and i'm not going to get into the details because they're they're pretty technical legal details but this is a problem that did not begin with Trump, as most of these problems did not begin with Trump. Other presidents had abused the vacancies reform, the vacancies uh, power. Anyway, it's just, it's, it's just not working well now. The president has too much discretion to put in people in senior jobs that the Constitution wanted to be Senate confirmed, and that, that needs to be fixed. Thank you. I agree with that yeah. one as well. And uh, there are so many uh, issues raised in your book that we haven't gotten to or haven't explored as fully as we could. But I think that we've given viewers and listeners a um, chance to get the idea of what needs reform. And I recommend that they read your book um, and see the details that are there. So thank you very much yeah. for spending this uh, just before New Year's with us. and. Thank you for writing the book, and we hope we'll visit with you again. Thank, thank you. So I'd like that, and thank you, thank you for reading the book and for your time and for your good questions. Thank you. Of course. Thanks so much. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Intergenerational Politics. Be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts to support future episodes. Thanks so much. See you in our next episode.